countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. Run that by me again. I just want to make sure I just heard you right. It sounds to me like you saying Ariel's missing. You heard right, Bunsen. She's been missing for a good long time now. Our only hope of finding her is you. Why? Why's it gotta be me? I's done through all this already. I's retired. I don't want to be messing around with no spiritual beings and alike. All I want is my rocking chair, my radio, my girlfriend. A nice hot meal at the end of the day wouldn't be unwelcome either. But this, I's true with it. You see me, I's done true. You can yell all you want, Bunsen. But the simple fact remains is that you are the only one who can rescue Ariel. That means you can whine, you can gripe, you can moan. But at the end of the day, you're going to rescue her. Because if you don't, and this castle falls, not just our realm, but yours as well, is going to crumble. Ariel is our only defense. Without her, all is lost. But why me? Why? Why has it got to be me? Why has it always got to be me? That's something you'll have to take up with Ariel once you locate her. I don't know the whys or the reasons. All I know is what she told me. You are her chosen. You would appear. You will rescue her. Beyond that, I don't know anything that will answer your question. Darn it. I was right. I will do it. But under protest. What's going on around here, is anyway? What are you guys doing to the castle? In the event that Ariel should ever be taken away, we've been ordered to surround the castle to set up instruments which would deflect any enemy's attempt to gain access to the interior. We are to defend the exterior at any and all cost. Needless to say, we're a poor substitute for Ariel. We won't last forever. We must have her return to us. And soon. Why soon? What's going to happen if Ariel don't come back? The castle will fall, and all the power within it will be removed. Once removed, this planet will disintegrate. This castle is the heart of this world. Without the heart, the world dies quickly, violently, as does everyone on it. I see. Who's the enemy? I'm not allowed to answer that, Bunsen. You'll have to hear it straight from Ariel. If she decides, you should know. All I can tell you right now is what Ariel told me to tell you. What you are supposed to do. All right. Let me have it. I'm to escort you inside the castle. There, you will be taken to a portal. The portal is centrally located on Ariel. Any who pass through it will always immediately be taken to her. You must enter the portal and free her from whatever place she is in, whatever time she may be held prisoner. If this world is in such danger, why haven't you entered the portal and gone after her yourself? Only the Chosen can enter the portal. Any other attempting to enter through it will be killed on contact. Tis why you stayed away from it. But wait a minute. How's I know I won't be killed on contact? Because I said so, Bunsen. I see. It sounds like Ariel done expected something like this to happen at some point. She's got her rescue all set up nicely. All you needed to do was wait for me to get here. 
I still think it's kind of odd how you knew I'd be coming here. I didn't even know I'd be coming here. And here's you is with the plan already in action on how to use me. It's screwy. It's, it, it's just plain darn screwy. Not as screwy as you think, mister. You're living on Earth with Captain Orville M.T., one of the most dangerous beings in the entire galaxy. Ariel knew that eventually he'd try to escape and use you as his instrument of escape. It was only a matter of time before something happened to you because of him. And something did, didn't it? I don't know what he did or how you ended up here now, but I do know it's because of him, isn't it? Yeah, you could say that. And me being an idiot while listening to him. A real five-star idiot. Look where he got me. Mixed up in all this again. An idiot. An idiot. And there will be time enough for you to kick yourself later, Bunsen. We don't have any to spare now. I need to get you to the portal and get you to Ariel. Once she's safe, you can have yourself a pity party and I'll bring the refreshments. But for now, I see ya. Unfortunately, I see ya. All right, let's go. What do you say his name was, Jenny? It's Sylvester. I don't know much about him, but he was sent here to live with Bunsen because his parents are going through a divorce. There's more to the story, but Bunsen's mom didn't have the time to tell me any of it. What with Bunsen being and uh sylvester already on his way she just had to run off to the train station to get him then bring him back here he was supposed to meet bunsen for the first time today but instead here we all are getting ready to say goodbye not the best of situations i know it just seems like that kid has misfortune following him around but when he gets here, we'll make him feel at home, Jenny. Don't worry, Sylvester will be welcome to this town and made to feel welcome at home, even if Bunsen can't be around to do that himself. We're Bunsen's family, his friends. Whatever he was to do, we'll do. That's what family is for. I'm so glad you said that, Lazar. Bunsen's mom said Sylvester will need all the help he can get once he gets here. She didn't go into any details about why or what's going on beside the divorce. But I got the feeling that Sylvester will need us more than anyone has ever needed us before. Until he gets here, though, all we can do is get ready. Yeah, ready. Huzzah! You, um, uh, never did finish that story. You were telling me about Bunsen when he was five years old. Whatever happened to him after he showed up to your house with his Superman costume? Oh, yeah. Well, like I said, he came over to my house to show Jingles and me what he'd done. What a costume, too. We congratulated him on how professionally made it was. Then Bunsen being Bunsen, he started going off on a tangent about how it wasn't just any ordinary Superman costume. It was special, made out of special fibers or something that made it really, really powerful. In fact, he said it really allowed him to be able to fly. I looked at Jingles and I guess Bunsen saw doubt in both of our eyes. Bunsen was never one to allow any slight to go unnoticed, so he launches into this monologue about how we shouldn't doubt him. He may have only been five years old, but he was still a lot smarter than most other people in this town. If someone would have a working Superman costume, why wouldn't it be him? Jingles. I don't remember what he said next, but whatever it was, it set Bunsen off something serious. It must have been Jingle's normal response, that Bunsen was letting his imagine get away from him, and he'd better not try anything foolish, or else he'd end up getting hurt. 
That's about what Jingles always says to Bunsen. Said to Bunsen. Then someone else came over. We heard the door knocking, and I went to answer it. It was Ollie. Even back then, Ollie had issues. But we have always tried to look the other way. Ollie came in and started talking to Bunsen, and Bunsen went back into his monologue about all these superpowers his costume gave him. Then Ollie said it, as he usually does. He said the one thing that probably shouldn't have been said. Definitely shouldn't have been said. He asked Bunsen to show him his powers in action. Oh boy, what a disaster that became. Speaking of Ollie, has anyone heard from him? Seen him? Has there been any sign of him at all as I? No, Ginny. Jingles and I were out half last night trying to find him. Nobody has any clue where he ran off to after the cave in. We just don't know. It's like he's vanished off the face of the earth. Well, it's time, Lazar. It's time. It's time to go. Yeah, I need to get there at least a little before the actual service begins. Mervyn will be filming Bunsen's memorial service so that Jingles and I can air it on our TV show. An episode dedicated to Bunsen. Mervyn has all the equipment and I was able to coax him out of his house. I think he feels he owes it to Bunsen after all. It was Mervyn who asked Bunsen to go into the cave. And Mervyn, well, he's never one to be normal or have a normal reaction to events. I guess working on this special is his way of seeking forgiveness. I'd like to get Mervyn and give him a piece of my mind. But I know it wouldn't make any difference. It was nobody's fault. Not really. It was an accident. An accident. That's what I keep telling myself. Trying to make myself believe. But oh, if only I could have someone to blame. If only there was someone I could blame for Bunsen's death. If only, if only. We better get going, Jenny. I don't know how either of us is going to make it through this afternoon. I just hope Jingles can be the strong one. Because if he can't, we're all going to crumble. This is just the worst, the worst thing that's ever happened to any of us. Ever. Tom Robinson, 19 years old. His friends called him Speedy. He'd earned the nickname. He always drove too fast, and that's what caused the accident. But what were the reasons for Tom's persistent speeding? What motivated him? What events led up to this tragic ending? I'm a traffic investigator, and it's my job to uncover the answers to these questions. Besides, I knew him personally, and I liked him. I called on his father first. Mr. Robinson was very cooperative and gave me a frank account of his son's driving history. Before Tom got his own car, Mr. Robinson told me, father and son had frequent arguments about who was going to use the family car. I gathered that Mr. Robinson himself was a pretty skillful driver, but aggressive and impatient behind the wheel. Probably he kept his good driving record only through luck and the courtesy of other more sensible drivers. I wondered how many of Tom's earliest attitudes toward driving and taking chances might have come from watching his own father. Then, with Mr. Robinson's help, Tom had been able to get a car of his own. 
He acted as if his whole life had led up to this moment. I remember I felt pretty much the same way about my first car. In spite of his own reckless driving habits, Mr. Robinson made it a point to urge his son to drive carefully and to observe all the traffic rules. First thing, Tom took the shortcut over the hills to his girlfriend's house to show her the new car. He and his father had already worked out a plan for Tom to repay the loan. Mr. Robinson told me, proudly, that his son had faithfully kept their agreement right up to the time of the accident. Tom appeared in traffic court once on a speeding ticket. He admitted he'd been speeding and was perfectly willing to pay the fine. But his father was outraged that the police wasted their time hauling in good, clean-cut kids for driving a little fast while the city was overrun with real criminals. I'd heard that idea many times. How much did it contribute to Tom's own attitude towards speeding? Tom's younger brother, Kenny, still very proud of him, said to me, Tom was the best driver in the world. He could have been a race driver. pretty clear that this obvious hero worship from his younger brother must have been important to Tom. Certainly, it helped to boost his own conviction that he was a skillful driver. Kenny would be old enough to apply for his driver's license in a few weeks. When he told me about the lessons Tom gave him, he made them sound like some of their happiest times together. I spoke with several of Tom's teachers. I learned that he was popular with his fellow students, although he wasn't particularly active in school affairs. The teachers agreed that he was conscientious and responsible. He was a good student, though not brilliant, and he usually showed good common sense. I made it a point to talk with some of Tom's friends. In his desire to be accepted, Tom always seemed to be trying to impress them with his driving. He sure could handle a car, they told me but there was no doubt they thought he was a pretty wild driver. Once Tom found that he'd earned his friend's admiration, he was anxious to keep up his reputation for fast driving. His girlfriend, Carol, told me that she liked riding with him. But I never realized what could happen, she told me. We always had such a great time. I learned that Tom used to brag about his technique for beating the rap if an officer stopped him for a traffic violation. His trick was always to be very pleasant and polite, to say he was sorry for what he'd done, and to agree with everything the officer said. On minor violations, it seems to have worked. He'd actually been stopped several times and let go with a warning. association with Tom came about through the Athletic League baseball team where I was coached. Tom's doctor had reported to me that he was in good physical shape and that his eyesight and reflexes were excellent. Only a few days before his accident he tried out for first base. He was always likable and conscientious but his playing was erratic and he just couldn't handle the position. I've often wondered if this failure might have upset him so much that he unconsciously tried to compensate for it in other ways. Perhaps it was one more factor in his compulsion to speed. Tom had a part-time job after school in a local drugstore. His employer told me that he was a dependable worker, friendly and polite. The pharmacist also told me that the day before the accident, Tom had asked for a raise. 
he had had to turn him down. Tom seemed unusually disappointed, he thought. He needed the extra money for his car insurance. Then, the following day, Tom drove Carol home after school and headed over the hills again on his way to work. It wasn't just one reason for Tom speeding, but lots of them, and they had brought us both here. His early difficulties with his father over the use of the family car might have caused him to think of it as a symbol of adult superiority. And his father's attitude and driving habits might have given him the dangerous idea that it's all right for a skillful driver to take chances. The admiration his speeding earned him from his younger brother and his apparent popularity with his friends must have been unusually important to him. Subconsciously, he may have looked upon speeding as a way of making up for those small failures and disappointments that we all have to face. I thought further about Kenny. As drivers, both his father and his older brother had set poor examples for him, but his own history and personality were different from his brother's. How good a driver would he turn out to be? I felt that Tom's speeding was an emotional outlet. He was probably compensating for feelings of insecurity and inferiority. Speeding was a kind of thrill-seeking for him, a childish defiance of authority, and a misdirected attempt to show superiority. These were surely some of the reasons for Tom's compulsion to speed. There may have been others. If there were, he took them with him. Types and mirrors. You'd think they'd use something else. It's good disguise. It's not like anyone looking at it would suspect it's a portal. Just a mirror. If it weren't that mirrors are used so much. Enough talk. It's time for action. Bunsen, go through that portal this instant. Time she is a wasting, and we don't have any time to waste. You know? I was glad you're a general, because with tact like that, you'd make an awful motivational speaker. Running headfirst into the mirror ain't exactly my idea of a good time you know. Nonsense. You'll be fine. You've done this before. Now get in there and bring Ariel back to us. Now, Bunsen. Now. All's right. But I was telling you, if I ever sees you again, don't expect no Christmas gift or birthday card. You's got a huge attitude problem. Okay, let's do this thing. Ariel, is that you? I just can hardly see a thing in this darkness. Is you there? Is you, Ariel? How are you doing, Jingles? You weren't out all night, were you? You did head home when I did, right? You didn't stay out all night searching for Ollie, did you? Lazar? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I am. Yeah, I did stay out all night. Looking for Ollie. I didn't find him, though. Nor did I find any trace of him. Just like always, his tracks just stopped in the middle of nowhere. For miles, you can see footprints in the dirt. Then, just as they get to the middle of an open field, they stop. It doesn't add up, Lazar, it doesn't. So many things in this town don't add up. I'm getting tired of feeling I, like I should be remembering something but not able to. Doing something but not able to. I feel like, I feel like I can turn this around, make things better. But first I have to remember, I have to remember everything. 
There'll be time for thinking later, Jingles. You shouldn't have stayed out all last night. But I can hardly blame you. I didn't go out last night, but that doesn't mean I got any sleep either. I doubt any of us have slept more than a few hours in the last few days. A few weeks, even. Every time I close my eyes, I see Bunsen. Whenever I'm alone, I can hear him calling my name. Whenever I'm laying down in bed, I can hear the house creak, and I think it's Bunsen. Bunsen walking by, coming into my room to give me a hug, and tell me everything will be all right. This just... this. I know, Ginny, I know. This is just the worst time of our lives. Bunsen, we... we didn't even get to say goodbye. That's what we're here for today, Lazar. That's what we're here to do. You're both right. Today is for one thing, for one person, for Bunsen. This is his day. You know, it's kind of odd. A year ago, and Bunsen would have thought us gathering together to honor his life would have been, I don't know, but something he'd absolutely have loved the thought of. But now with how he changed, I think he'd like us to keep this short and to the point. Serious, but not over emotional. I think if Bunsen were here, he'd want this to be about us, about staying together, not about him, his life, or anything he did. He'd want us to go on, I know. Sentimental nonsense, isn't it? No, it isn't, Jingles. I think you're right. Bunsen wouldn't want us wallowing in tears. He'd want us to remember him, then take up our responsibilities and live for tomorrow. But first we've got to live today. We'll live today, we'll survive. Then tomorrow we'll start anew. But for now, for this minute, let's go remember our friend. Let's go and honor Bunsen. Marvin, please, get these tacos off this podium. I don't care if you didn't eat breakfast. Get this food out of here. It's totally inappropriate to be eating right before we say goodbye to our best friend. I'm serious, Marvin. Get these tacos out of here. Ariel, I can see you. It is you, right? Yeah. Yeah, it is you. Taking you prisoner. I am alive. I am well. I can be no other way, Bunsen. I may have been taken prisoner, but fear not. There is nothing man made. There is nothing made by other than man. There is nothing in any universe which can cause me harm. It is good to see you, my friend. We have much to discuss, Bunsen. Much. I've got a million and one questions that I need answered, but I'll skip the million for now and get to the one. The one question that's been egging me on ever since I done lost that communicator. Way back when it sealed the rift and restored balance to the universe. I've been wondering, thinking, and postulating about this for months and months and months. Now, now, now that I'm here, now that you're telling me you as well, unharmed and able to talk. Now, I finally, finally, finally get my answer. 